contemporary clinical care and research. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have two papers, and then there'll be a break for lunch for about uh, 90 minutes. So there'll be a, a, a nice break there, and then we'll continue again in the afternoon. And uh, without further ado, the first speaker is our own John Shorling, who's a professor in the School of Medicine and uh, is uh, the head of the Mindfulness Center at the medical school and has been heavily involved in, in that practice and that tradition for many, many years. And he's going to give us a slides and a presentation entitled The Origin and Impact of Mindfulness in Western Medicine. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and it's good to be here. This is a, a great uh, event, I think, bringing together, as we said, four schools of the uh, from the university, um, and as well as outside speakers. Um, and I think it's a, this um, talk really uh, is a follow-up on um, some of Fred's comments about where, um, uh, where we're going in bringing some of these uh, Eastern traditions into Western medicine. Um, and we're not really going to have time to talk about the basic question that he, that he uh, posed about uh, what is the role of taking these traditions from, these practices from their traditions into Western medicine. Um, we're not really going to have time to talk about that, although I will say that it's, it's definitely a conversation that's ongoing at the Contemplative Sciences Center. And then I use the term Western medicine in the title of this talk. Um, but what I'm really referring to is that the other term we use is allopathic medicine, or really the, the type of medicine that's practiced in the health center here at, at UVA. There are other Western medical traditions be, besides that, but that's really what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and so just as an overview, um, I am going to um, talk about mindfulness, and in particular, mindfulness-based stress reduction. And when I talk about mindfulness today, it really is from um, the vantage point of the specific type of mindfulness training called mindfulness-based stress reduction. Kim Pemberthy, who's following me, is going to be talking about mindfulness-based relapse prevention, which is another application of mindfulness. comes from the same basic background, but it's a little different than mindfulness-based stress reduction. I'm going to talk about the health, uh, briefly about the health effects of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, then a little bit about burnout and the impact of mindfulness training among healthcare providers. And then finally, a quick overview of uh, some of the potential me mechanisms for the effects of MBSR. Um, and MBSR is the, is the acronym we use for, for mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, I did just want to give a, a brief overview of the history of the use of meditation in healthcare um, in the United States. Um, and it really began, it began a little bit before this, but uh, the big movement to bring meditative practices into medicine really began with transcendental meditation um, in the 1960s and the first publication um, by R.L. Wallace in 1970. And it wasn't a bad start in that the, the first publication about transcendental meditation and its effects um, was in Science, which is the premier um, journal uh, in the sciences, um, one of the premier journals in the sciences in the world. So this is a pretty auspicious start, actually, for uh, the study of meditation. And then, um, um, Herbert Benson actually worked with R.L. Wallace uh, on transcendental meditation, but then he adapted it into what he called the relaxation response, secularizing it even more and getting rid of the word meditation. Um, uh, completely. And Herbert Benson is a cardiologist at Harvard, so this is a movement from R.L. Wallace was a physiologist, but actually worked um, within the transcendental meditation community. Herbert Benson was a cardiologist at Harvard and really brought a different level of um, respectability to the practices. And then in 1979, um, John Kabat-Zinn developed mindfulness-based stress reduction and um, that really led to the explosion of interest in mindfulness over the past 30-some um, years. And there's the definitions. There are a number of definitions of mindfulness. The one that's used primarily in this um, 
the practices associated with mindfulness-based stress reduction is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So there are really three aspects of this. It's paying attention to present moment experience, doing it intentionally, and bringing um, uh, a uh, spirit of non-judging to doing that. So what is mindfulness-based stress reduction? Um, I just wanted to give, because I'm going to be talking about it a lot, I wanted to give a brief overview. It's an eight-week course. Um, there are weekly two-and-a-half-hour sessions, one all-day silent retreat. And the components that are taught include sitting and walking meditation, yoga, and the body scan, as well as uh, discussions of various forms of stress and coping strategies. And one of the things we talk about um, a lot uh, in this training is both formal practice, that is sitting down and doing breath meditation for a period of time, and informal practice, where we actually take what we learn from doing the formal practice and bring it into the rest of our lives. And in, um, uh, we ask students who take these classes to do 45 minutes of practice six days a week. So where did this come from? Well, it's actually quite interesting. Um, and I do another aside. Um, uh, before I, I talk about the genesis, is uh, the reference that's listed at the bottom of this um, uh, slide, this volume of contemporary Buddhism in 20, uh, 2011, actually is entirely devoted to, the, to uh, the intersection between mindfulness and Buddhism. And really, a number of the authors address the question, again, that Fred raised about uh, what is this all about, taking these practices from these traditions and applying them in Western medicine. So if you're interested in that topic, I would refer you to this, uh, this entire issue of this journal was devoted to that question. So um, John Kabat-Zinn developed MBSR in 1979. And the story of where it came from was actually, as you can see in the second point there, is quite interesting. He had a vision at a Vipassana retreat at the Insight Meditation Society. On the 10th day of a 14th day retreat, he was sitting in his room, and it came to him in its entirety. Uh, and it's existed essentially the same way ever since. He wrote it down after that retreat. He began teaching it at the University of Massachusetts the following year, and the rest is history. Um, his motivation, as he says in this article, is, was to relieve suffering and catalyze greater compassion and wisdom in our lives and culture. MBSR has primarily Buddhist roots. And again, this is a quote from the, uh, the same article um, from John. MBSR was developed as one of a possibly infinite number of skillful means for bringing the Dharma into mainstream settings. So even though MBSR is a secularized version of these practices, Buddhism is never mentioned explicitly when we teach uh, MBSR. It's very clear that um, it, it has strong Buddhist roots. And John says, again, one more comment about the bringing these traditions into Western medicine, he talks about not a decontextualizing of these practices, but a recontextualizing of these practices. The principal influence is um, from Theravada Buddhism, Vipassana in particular, but there are also influences from Mahayana and Zen traditions, in particular the koan-based dharma combat of one of John's principal teachers, Seng San, um, where we have inquiry into the classes, where we uh, as teachers spend a lot of time with students inquiring into the nature of their practice and what's arising for them. And there uh, are influences from yogic tradition as well, very explicit in that we teach hatha yoga uh, poses as part of the mindfulness practices. For his publication on uh, MBSR um, was in 1982, an outpatient program of behavioral medicine for chronic pain patients based on the practice of mindfulness meditation theoretical considerations, and preliminary results. So there was one publication in 1982, one or two a year till 1995, almost 100 between 2000 and 2004, over 400 between 2004 and 2009, and 800 in the last three years. There are now over 3,000 publications um, in the last 30 years about uh, mind, related to mindfulness in healthcare. Um, and these are, uh, this was mindfulness searched in a healthcare database, not in the database of, of religious literature. This was solely in healthcare. 
So now over 3,000 publications. So in the remaining time, I'm going to give you what I think are some of the highlights out of those 3,000 publications. Um, so first of all, just briefly, health benefits of mindfulness-based stress reduction. An uh, a review, an analysis of multiple studies was done in the uh, journal, of, published in the Journal of Psychosomatic Research in 2004. At that time, there were 20 studies, including seven randomized trials, which we consider to be the, the best type of study um, to do. They looked at both mental health and physical health uh, variables among patients with chronic pain, cancer, and CAD stands for coronary artery disease. And they found this effect size of 50% means individuals who went through the, the course classes compared to people who didn't, on average, had a 50% greater improvement in whatever they were measuring, whether it was stress uh, or pain, that people who went through the courses did 50% better than the people who didn't. And then a more recent uh, review, um, just a couple of years ago, of another 18 um, controlled studies looking at psychological health in particular, showed that uh, individuals who went through the, this eight-week courses had decreased anxiety, decreased depression, decreased perceived stress, increased positive affect, that means overall mood, increased self-compassion, and increased quality of life. So um, significant evidence uh, now of the potential health benefits um, from these classes and these practices. I wanted to talk uh, a little bit more about occupational stress, which is one of my particular interests. Occupational stress is very common in a number of professions, including teachers, nurses, and doctors where the rates of burnout um, in recent studies have exceeded 40% in all of those professions. And what do we mean by burnout? Well, when you hear the term burnout, most of the time, especially if it's related to a research study, it's burnout measured by something called the Maslach Burnout Inventory, which has three components. The first is emotional exhaustion, which is just what it sounds like. It's being emotionally overextended and exhausted by work, coming home at the end of the day and saying, oh man, I'm just drained is emotional exhaustion. The personalization um, tends to follow emotional exhaustion, and that's uh, developing a negative or cynical attitude and treating others um, as objects. And one of the ways that's manifested in healthcare is when we start talking about patients as their diseases. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just shorthand, so if you happen to hear a healthcare provider talking about someone this way, it doesn't automatically mean they have burnout. But it often, it, it often is an indicator. So instead of saying, Mrs. Jones who had the heart, uh, the heart attack in room seven, we just say the heart attack in room seven, the disease that we're paying attention to, not the patient. So that's the second stage of burnout. And the third is a, a sense of low personal accomplishment, feelings of incompetence, inefficiency, and inadequacy. Just feeling like what we're doing um, doesn't have a purpose. It's not meaningful anymore. So those are the three components of burnout. And when we say someone has burnout, we mean they score high on any one of those three things. It doesn't mean all three. It could be just one of them. So a study done last year, published um, uh, last year, done by the American Medical Association, so a, a random sample of physicians from across the country, found among physi practicing physicians now in the United States, the burnout rate is 46%. Almost half of all physicians in this country now uh, have one of those, at least one of those characteristics that was on the last slide. And there's some specialties where it's over half. Emergency medicine, general internal medicine, which is actually my field. I practice general internal medicine and palliative care, neurology and, and family medicine. And so um, of note on this slide are that two of the three uh, primary care, principal primary care specialties in this country, general internal medicine and family medicine are on the list. And as we expand healthcare, have this great need for primary care physicians, um, it creates a potential dilemma for us. Medical students aren't immune. Studies of medical students over the past few years have also shown that their rates of burnout are about 50%. Um, and that's across all four years of medical school. It, the rates go up about six months into the first year and remain high throughout medical school. Although, um, even without any intervention, a quarter of students who are burnt, have burnout in one year, it's gone the next year. So as a result, there have been several adaptations of MBSR that have been developed for uh, healthcare providers. One was done at the University of Rochester, um, mindful communication program for primary care physicians, which included aspects of the mindfulness-based stress reduction program that I meant. And in this study, they showed improved mindfulness, decreased burnout, improved mental health status, increased empathy, 
And they followed up the people in their study for 15 months, and they had decreased burnout 15 months after the program. We've developed an eight-week course here that's much more closely related to mindfulness-based stress reduction, which essentially is, is identical to MBSR, except for the last uh, bullet point there, where we place uh, significantly more emphasis on kindness and compassion than in mindfulness-based stress reduction. And that's um, in part because uh, individuals who go into healthcare and helping fields often have high standards for themselves and are, and are self-critical. And when things don't go well, the outcomes aren't the way they hoped for. They can wind up blaming themselves a lot and, um, uh, and often don't have a lot of self-compassion, don't have an understanding of their own suffering and a willingness or an openness to, uh, to addressing their own suffering. And I believe that before we can truly be compassionate with others, we have to be compassionate with ourselves first. So we really focus on self-compassion in this course. Uh, to date, 112 participants, 59 physicians, 53 other health providers, including nurses, psychologists, social work, workers, and others. The first study I showed you from the University of Rochester was all doctors. Our classes include doctors and other health care providers. And these are the results. Um, improvement in overall mental health of 25%, reduction in emotional exhaustion by 20%, reduction in depersonalization by 25%, improvement in personal accomplishment by almost 10%. And our results and those from the University of Rochester are essentially the same. They're, pretty, they're identical. They're almost identical. So these courses in mindfulness um, have shown to have a benefit for physicians and other health care providers who are especially at risk for burnout and work-related stress. So why do we do this? And when I say this, why, in, these, in the context of these classes in particular, why are we so self-critical? Why do, and when you think about it, and this is really one of the foundational principles underlying mindfulness practice is that it's our thoughts that create so much stress. We spend so much time thinking about the future, worrying about the past, and we're not paying attention to the present moment, which again in the mindfulness definition is intentional present moment awareness non-judgmentally. So the reason we now understand more why we do this really comes from related, associated with this explosion in mindfulness research in general has been much greater sophistication in neuroscience and really being able to understand, to a degree never possible before, the underlying mechanisms of what's going on in our brain. And so we've described through neuroscience that we have this default state of narrative self-reference, which is based on linking subjective experiences across time. That means thinking about the past, worrying about the future. We're telling stories to ourselves all the time. And there's certain parts of the brain that light up when we do functional MRI studies, and I'm going to talk about that more in a, uh, in a minute. And the other thing we know about our brains is the more we use uh, certain pathways, the more they uh, robust they become. Our brains are plastic. They're changing all the time. When I went to medical school, I learned that our brains were pretty much fully formed and fixed by the time we went to kindergarten. And it was downhill from there. And we know that's not true anymore. Our brains are constantly creating new connections, and we have influence over those. So I'm going to show a, a couple fMRI um, slides, so I just wanted to describe what this is. Magnetic resonance imaging, even though they're done in radiology departments, isn't an x-ray. It's actually an MRI machine. It's a giant magnet. And if you ever let, have laid in an MRI and heard the funking, it's the magnets going. Um, and uh, Hemoglobin, which is what carries oxygen in the blood, um, is affected by a magnetic field differently, whether it has oxygen or it doesn't. So hemoglobin carries oxygen, it delivers it to cells, and it's used in the cells. And so using F, uh, MRI, we can measure when the oxygen goes out of the blood. And this is called the blood oxygen level dependent signal. And less oxygen in the blood is an indirect measure of the areas of the brain that are more active. So here's an fMRI of people sitting in an MRI in the default condition of, of narrative self-reference, of just uh, thinking about the past, worrying about the future. And these are the parts of the brain that light up. In particular, the prefrontal cortex. This is at the front of the brain. This is the, the skull. This is the front of the brain. Uh, and this whole big area lights up. Again, when I went to medical school, I learned that a very reductionistic view of the brain, that there was a spot in the brain that took care of everything. and so. At that point, we would have thought there was a narrative self-reference point in the brain. That's not true at all. 
obviously you can see it's a whole network that involves the thinking part of the brain um, and a few other areas. But this is the thinking part of the brain. So basically this is just showing we're thinking, we're thinking about things in this state. Experiential uh, self-focus is really mindfulness. It's paying attention to present moment experiences of thoughts, emotions, and bodily sensations. So in this study, they took people who had been through an MBSR class, or those who hadn't, and did the functional MRIs on them again. And they showed differences in the brain. Um, and these blue areas are areas that were decreased, and the red area, or the yellow areas were increased. And then they looked at the correlation between areas. And what, what's important about this slide, really, and what the authors pointed out, was this little thing here, which shows a certain part of the, the PFC is the prefrontal cortex, this ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And that's the area that was really lighting up on the last, on the, the first slide I showed you. And the insula, which is the area of the part of the brain where we really interpret emotion, is disconnected in people, or the, the connection is reduced in people who go through mindfulness training. And that makes sense. When we get in this narrative self-reference, we have a thought, it causes worry, it stimulates this part of the brain, the insula which creates physical sensations, and then we worry more, and we get into this cycle. And what the authors thought from this study was that mindfulness practice and beginning to pay attention to the present moment experience uncouples the insular part of the brain from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, so we're not so caught up in that cycle. So this, I think, is a, is a really significant study in that regard. So that was functional MRI. Um, that was looking at the function of the brain. There's also, also structural MRI, um, which is what you're used to. If you have a normal MRI, it's a structural MRI. It's looking at the structure in the body, not the function. So this is another study before and after an MBSR course where they measured stress using a specific scale. And then they looked at the brain using regular MRI. And they showed that the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that's primarily involved in both uh, fear-based responses, strong emotional responses, and memory, that not only was the function changed, but the size of the amygdala was actually smaller. And the amygdala, this, this tiny little part of the brain right here. Um, but as stress went down, the size of the amygdala went down. So this gets back to what I was saying before. Not only does the function of our brain change, the structure actually changes. And this was a really important study in showing that a, a, a part of the brain intimately involved with emotion actually changes size after only eight weeks of practice. Another thing I wanted to talk about was a study we did here um, looking at patients with palpitations. And palpitations are um, uh, irregular heartbeats that are um, disconcerting. This was done um, with a number of other people here, Justine Owens and Peggy Plews-Ogan from General Medicine with me and John Dent and Randall Mormon, who are cardiologists. Um, but these were people who had disabling palpitations without serious underlying heart disease. And we randomly assigned them to mindfulness-based stress reduction or immediately or doing the course later. And we measured heart rate variability, which is the beat-to-beat -beat variation in the heart, measured in very tiny intervals. It's not heart rate, it's the variability in rate. Um, between beats. And it reflects the balance between the sympathetic, which is the stress response part of the brain, the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is associated more with relaxation. Low heart rate variability is associated with stress and increased uh, sympathetic hormones like adrenaline. And it's been associated with infections and premature infants and with mortality and heart attacks. People who have this high uh, adrenaline in their body are more likely to suffer um, more likely to die after they've had heart attacks. So first of all, in our study, we showed the uh, people who were in the MBSR group are in red, and the uh, other group who didn't take it are in uh, blue. And the blue folks had the same number of palpitations, both at baseline after the class and four weeks later. And you can see there was a significant reduction in, in palpitations um, in the patients who uh, had taken the class. And then we looked at their heart rate variability. And what this showed is that one month after people finished the course, how much there, this shows the, a greater reduction in palpitations. So as we're going out here, people at, at this end had more reduction in their palpitations than at this end. 
there was a strong correlation with increased heart rate variability, which is decreased sympathetic tone. So the mindfulness classes not only affected their perception of their palpitations, it actually had an effect on their hearts. And then finally, um, there have been a lot of studies that have looked at um, the immune response in patients, uh, in individuals with mindfulness training. And one of the things um, about all these studies that I've talked with you about so far is that the people who go through the mindfulness training have been, have been compared to people who haven't. Uh, and one of the big criticisms of, the, of a lot of this literature is, well, if you take any group of people, you get together two and a half hours every week, you talk about your problems, but after eight weeks, you're likely to feel better um, and have less stress. So it's not that it's anything unique about mindfulness, it's that people are just de-stressed because they've gotten together with folks who they come to like, and they get to spend two and a half hours with them every week. So the people at the University of Washington and, and Richard Davidson's group, which is probably now the preeminent group in the United States looking at the neuroscience of meditation, they designed this Health Ascent Enhancement Program, or HEP, which is the same amount of time as mindfulness-based stress reduction, but doesn't involve any mindfulness practice. And it, at the end of eight weeks, the people who go through this program have the same perceived reduction in stress as the people who go through mindfulness-based stress reduction. So it causes the same reduction in stress. So what this group wanted to look at was, OK, it causes the same reduction in stress. Does it cause the same reduction or the same effect on the immune system, which other studies have shown for mindfulness? And so they, they had the same reduction in stress, but MBSR was associated with sig significantly smaller post-stress responses measured by um, inflammatory markers in the blood. TNF is tumor necrosis factor, and this is an interleukin. These are things, these are compounds we measure in the blood that re are released with inflammation. And so, in this, um, the uh, red line is the MBSR group, the green line is the, uh, my, the uh, enhancement group. I can't remember the full name of their. And th this showed as people meditated more, their inflammation went down. As people did the enhancement techniques more, their inflammation went up. And that was true for two markers. So this was really, uh, again, this was just published earlier this year. This is really a landmark study in that it addressed the issue. It's not just getting together with a bunch of people for two and a half hours every eight weeks. There's something specific about, there seems to be something in addition about doing mindfulness practice that in this case affects the immune response, not uh, that's different. And so this was another really important study. So in summary, uh, as I mentioned, as I started with, MBSR is rooted in, in both Buddhist and yogic um, traditions. There's certainly been an explosion of interest in research and mindfulness, especially over the last 10 years. And what I think a lot of this shows is that where we choose to place uh, our attention matters. That, uh, uh, paying attention, practicing paying attention to our present moment experience uh, makes a difference um, and has a number of health benefits. And the things that we talked about today, paying attention to the present moment, I showed evidence that it can affect the mind, both functionally and structurally, it can affect the heart in terms of heart rate variability, and it can uh, affect the immune system. And that in the, uh, it does, in fact, have the potential to improve overall well-being. Thank you.